Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture on machine learning foundations. In the previous lectures, uh, we introduced the supervised learning paradigm and went into detail on uh, the two main problems, two main types of uh, supervised learning tasks which are regression and classification. In this lecture, we are going to start on unsupervised on the unsupervised learning paradigm and the two main tasks associated with it which are dimensionality reduction and density estimation. In contrast to supervised learning which had very clear and marked goals and uh, ways of quantifying them, unsupervised learning is typically much more vague and uh, unsupervised learning typically is used as a pre-processing step and not as an end in itself. Uh, vaguely unsupervised learning can be viewed as based for understanding data right? and data in our context here is simply going to be a collection of vectors. Note that in contrast to supervised learning which always had two pairs of xi, yi, here you have just xi which are just a collection of d-dimensional vectors. Uh, the goal of unsupervised learning is to build models that compress, explain and group data which is what I am broadly grouping as understanding. We will explain what all of these mean with two specific examples which are dimensionality reduction and uh, density estimation. Here is an example of how unsupervised learning can be useful. Right? Unsupervised learning as I mentioned is typically not used as an end in itself because the outputs of unsupervised learning algorithms by themselves are not useful, but after human interpretation and after other machine learning tasks, they can become very valuable. For example, let us say you are uh, uh, you are a marketing uh, manager at Coca-Cola right? and your job is to collect the tweets about Coca-Cola and summarize them to your boss. Right? So, that is your job and let us say in any given week there are let us say 1 million, uh, 10 mil sorry, a million tweets about Coca-Cola that happen in a given week. There is no way you can show all the million tweets to your, uh, to your boss and explain what each tweet is, it is just not possible. Uh, a reasonable thing to do would be if you can group these let us say a million tweets into 10 distinct groups, right. So, maybe you can have one group of people who are all just uh, taking selfies with uh, coke in a new place or maybe there is another group of uh, uh, tweets which are uh, from other brands which has, uh, which are doing some co-branding deal or you can have another uh, group of tweets which are all about uh, people who are promoting coke and paid by coke. right? So, there are several groups which we can potentially think of and if you can even without actually tell, giving this information, if you could potentially group these million tweets into 10 manageable groups and understand what these groups are by going through these groups and then you can go to your manager and say well there are 10 types of uh, tweets that happened uh, this week and the type 1 tweets are all tweets by people uh, who are uh, buying coke for the first time and tweeting uh, about it from a store near their house and uh, at group 2 is all people uh, who are, uh, are all businesses which are collaborating with coke and so on. And you can easily summarize such a situation to your boss and the boss you can do that in a reasonable amount of time and uh, you can get your job done. So, this is an example of unsupervised learning. You can note that the what the unsupervised learning does is simply group the tweets into 10 groups, right. So, that is the that is what it does. Anything beyond that interpreting these groups is typically the job of the human being because groups by themselves are meaningless. Only when you assign uh, coherent meaning to such a group would, uh, it, would it be actionable or useful. Right? So, that is done by the human which is which in this case would be you. That is the reason why I said unsupervised learning is typically not an end in itself, but rather uh, a, a pre-processing stage which is used by other, other processes. Right? Uh, here is one example of uh, one concrete example of unsupervised learning which is dimensionality reduction. So, the goal of dimensionality reduction might is compression and simplification. Right? Where would it be useful for? For example, let us say you have uh, you are a, a genetic company and you want to uh, 
export or com uh, comprehensively store the million gene expression levels of a million people. Right? So, you have you, you have gene results of a million people and each uh, uh, each person has let us say million genes. Right? So, you what you have is you have, store, you have computed the gene expression levels of these million genes of million people. So, in principle it is a 10 power 6 cross 10 power 6 matrix. Right? So, you have million people each having million genes. So, if you have the entire data that is um, uh, that is a 10 power 6 cross 10 power 6 uh, numbers and there is no way you can let us say transmit this data from one lab to another lab it is just not possible. What would be nice would be if you can compress this data into a simpler format which can be used for transmitting right. So, that is one reasonable goal to have and dimensionality reduction is one of the main tools that you can use for such a task for such a goal. Uh, formally writing mathemat uh, mathematical terms that is you might have data n d dimensional vectors x 1 to x n and the goal of dimensional reduction is to come up with two models unlike all the other uh, previous cases like classification or regression where the goal of uh, the dimension uh, the learning algorithm was to come up with a single model. The goal of a dimensional reduction algorithm is to come up with two models an encoder and a decoder. Right? What does the encoder do? The encoder is a function which takes in a d dimensional vector and outputs a d dash dimensional vector. Typically d dash is less than d, typically d dash is much lesser than d. Effectively the encoder compresses a d dimensional vector into a d dash dimensional vector and the decoder essentially hopes to undo the effect of the encoder. The decoder takes a d dash dimensional vector and outputs a d dimensional vector. What is the goal of the encoder and the decoder? So, that if you take any input in your data and you encode it and you decode it again, you should get back the original data. Right? The goal is that your g of f of x i should be equal to x i, but you are willing to relax it and say that as long as it is approximately equal to x i, you are happy. So, that is the goal now. The goal is g of f of x i is approximately equal to x i. And how do you measure approximation? Well, a reasonable way of measuring approximation would be to simply measure uh, take g of f of x i minus x i and view that as a vector and compute the norm squared or the length squared of that vector. I, if this was equal to 0, then the g of f of norm of g of f of x i minus x i the whole squared if that was 0 clearly g of f of x i is equal to x i. But in general it need not be equal to 0, you are looking for a pair of encoder and decoder so that g of f of x i minus x i the norm squared of that is as small as possible. And once again you are averaging this over all n possible input all the all the n inputs as 1 by n sigma i equal to 1 to n norm of g of f of x i minus x i the whole square. Right. Here is a very simple uh, illustration uh, to show how the dimensionality reduction can work. Right? So, let us take a very simple example here. Let us say you have d is equal to 2 and d dash is equal to 1 in this case. Right? So, it is a very simple example. Like you have 4, let us say you have 4 training points. This is the 4 training points. This, this is your x. The 4 training points are let us say 1, 0 0.8. The second training point is let us say 2 comma 2.2, third is 3 comma 3.2 and the fourth is 4 comma 3.8. This is your uh, two dimensional data and you are looking for an encoder which takes in a two dimensional vector and outputs a scalar and a decoder which takes in a scalar or, or a one dimensional vector and outputs a two dimensional vector. We will consider two uh, possibilities for this right. So, let us uh, take one uh, let us say f of x is equal to uh, one possibility is let us say x 1 minus x 2 right and g of u is u comma u. 
Note that f is a mapping from R2 to R which means that x is a 2 dimensional vector but x1 minus x2 is clearly a scalar right, x1 minus x2 is clearly a scalar. f is a mapping which takes in a 2 dimensional vector and outputs a scalar and g is a mapping which takes a decoder which takes in the scalar u and outputs a vector 2 dimensional vector u comma u. Right? So, now let us uh, what f is right, so f would be this in this case would be 0 0.2. Uh, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 right. So, why is that because x1 minus x2 is 1 minus 0.8 is 0.2, 2 minus 2.2 is minus 0 0.2 and so on. And what is the g? g would essentially take in the output of f, the encode the f of x and g of f of x should ideally be equal to x for the training points x1, x2, x3 and x4. If you do that for this the first training point g of 0 0.2 is the vector 0 0.2 comma 0 0.2. You can immediately see that 0 0.2 comma 0 0.2 is not equal to 1 comma 0 0.8 and it is quite distance away right. We can do the same thing for this. The second data point will be minus 0 0.2 comma minus 0 0.2 and the third minus 0 0.2 comma minus 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 comma you have you have encoded this using the encoder and decoder given you have encoded the input and decoded it and this is what you get. You can clearly see this is not a very good encoder and decoder because uh, both 1 comma 0 0.8 and 4 comma 3.8 if you run it through the encoder and decode it again you get the same 0.2 comma 0.2 even though you have two very distinct inputs getting mapped to the same output. So, this is not doing a very good job of uh, uh, compressing losslessly right. So, it is doing some compression you are representing a 2 dimensional uh, vector by a 1 dimensional scalar, but you are losing out right. I mean you are uh, the goal is to get even though you lose I mean even though you store using lesser number of space or lesser number of numbers, but you want to get back the original input issue your goal is to not lose out the input. But on the other hand, but this particular example of encoder and decoder is not doing a good job of doing that. Right? Now, let us uh, consider another encoder decoder pair. Uh, let us uh, have f tilde and g tilde. f tilde of uh, x is let us say x1 plus x2 by 2 and g tilde of uh, u is u comma u. If you do the same thing uh, for f tilde and g tilde, let us see what that gives us. I will just erase uh, this. f tilde and g tilde. f tilde for the first data point would be x1 plus x2 by 2 which is 0.9. Uh, 2 plus 2.2 by 2 is 2.1, uh, 3 plus 3.2 by 2 is 3.1 and 4 plus 3.8 by 2 is 3.9. Right? This is the encoder output and the decoder if you apply it uh, to the output of the encoder would be 0 0.9 comma 0 0.9, 2.1 comma 2.1, 3.1 comma 3.1 and 3.9 comma 3.9. You can clearly see that this is a much better uh, encoder decoder than the previous one. Why is that? Because 1 comma 0 0.8 and 0.9 comma 0 0.9 is pretty close and 4 comma 3.8 and 3.9 comma 3.9 is also pretty close and all the 2 comma 2.2 and 2.1 comma 2.1 is close, 3 comma 3.2 and 3.1 comma 3.1 is also close. Let us actually do a plotting for this. So, uh, this is the x1 axis, this is the x2 axis. You had 4 points which correspond to let us say 1 comma 0 0.8, 2 comma 2.2, uh, 3 comma 3.2 and 4 comma 3.8 right. So, you had these 4 data points. If you had used the encoder and decoder given by f and g, uh, the 4 uh, f of g of x1 
sorry g of f of x 1 would be 0.2 comma 0.2, g of f of uh, x 2 would be minus 0.2 comma minus 0.2 and uh, g of f of x 3 would also be minus 0.2 comma minus 0.2 and g of f of x 4 would also be equal to 0.2 comma 0.2. You would have the 4 outputs of the encoder decoder pair would essentially be these 4 numbers 0.2 comma 0.2 and minus 0.2 comma minus 0.2 which is clearly not a very good approximation. But on the other hand, if you do the same thing for f tilde and g tilde, you get really good numbers. Okay. So, you get for the first f tilde, g tilde applied on x1, you would get 0.9 comma 0.9 which is close to here and 2.1 comma 2.1 which is close here. I am not being very exact here to just get you the approximate idea of where the 4 points are. You can see that f of f tilde of g, g tilde of f tilde of x i is very very close to x i when compared to g of f of x i. So, we will say that g tilde comma f tilde form a much uh, form a better encoder decoder or f tilde comma g tilde form a better encoder decoder than f comma g. Right? Once again this is a very simplified dimensional reduction algorithm where we are already giving two pairs of encoder decoder f comma g or f tilde comma g tilde and asking the dimensionality reduction algorithm to choose among these two. In the reality, it would choose the best function from Rd to Rd dash as for encoder and the best function Rd dash to Rd for decoder, infinite number of functions. That is what a real dimensionality reduction learning algorithm would do. Uh, here is a tie illustration where it just chooses between these two different encoder decoder pairs. So, with that I think we can uh, wrap the dimensionality reduction uh, part of the thing.